Well, that you just well, mentioned there in the courts. Right. What was not true, that, that there were states where ballots were sent out without people asking for them, where there were changes in verification, where there were instances where ballots were not being supervised at drop-off places. The, the president was told, given advice, that under these circumstances, the state legislatures have the ultimate ability to qualify electors. He followed that advice. Now, you may disagree as to whether or not those things actually occurred or not. That's why we have political debate. We don't have criminal trials over that. We have the discussion but like we're just having. But it matters if those things actually occurred or not, John. Not under the First but Amendment. it matters if those things no. actually occurred because... Not, not at all, because it, under the it First Amendment... It doesn't matter if it was actually fraud. No, no, the First Amendment allows... But, John, let me stop you there, because yeah. if, if he's saying that there was fraud, the First Amendment doesn't allow the President of the United States to go and claim there was fraud when he was told there was not fraud and then try to subvert the election by overturning legitimate electors. I mean, it says Amendment it right here in the speech. actual indictment. Absolutely. The First Amendment protects so, all so it prote If we're going to have a, a situation where the Department of Justice is going to fact-check politicians and indict politicians for political speech and whether or not they're factually accurate, then this country will shut down politically because it's a never ending cycle of tit for tat. And that's the risk of injecting politics into the criminal justice system. So right now people disagree with President Trump. What's going to happen four years from now if somebody disagrees with President Biden in terms of what he said during the election? That's why we don't criminalize political speech. Political speech under the First Amendment has, has an almost absolute protection. Nobody gets to judge whether it's true or not except the American people. And but we John, do that in an election. We do that in an election. We do that in the case of a president by impeachment. But we don't indict people. I miss your dinner, but I have a feeling you like this better. Do you like this? Should I do the snake? Should I? The snake, you know, it's about 100 degrees out, so if we're outside, you say, no, please don't do the snake. But it's great. This was a, a great song written a long time ago, and uh, we sort of recast it, but it's true. And it has to do with terrorism. Uh, we're allowing people to come in. They're going to destroy our country. We have to get them out. We have to take them out. So this has to do with the fact that people are coming into our country through our borders, very sad and very terrible thing is happening, and many of these people are very bad. On her work, and this is, uh, who's heard this, by the way, just before? Who's heard this? That's pretty good. It's amazing how few, because they do it, but I think it's pretty terrific. On her way to work one morning, down the path along the lake, a tender-hearted woman saw a poor, half-frozen snake. Her pretty colored skin had been all frosted with the dew. Poor thing, she cried, I'll take you in, and I'll take care of you. Take me in, O oh, tender woman, take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh, tender woman, sighed the vicious snake. She wrapped him up all cozy in a comforter of silk and laid him by her fireside with some honey and some milk. She hurried home from work that night, and as soon as she arrived, she found the pretty snake she'd taken in had been revived. Take me in, O oh tender woman, take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh tender woman, sighed the vicious snake. She clutched him to her bosom. You're so beautiful, she cried. But if I hadn't brought you in by now, you truly would have died. She stroked his pretty skin again and kissed and held him tight. But instead of saying, thank you, ma'am, the snake gave her a vicious bite. Take me in, O oh tender woman, take me in for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh tender woman, sighed the vicious snake. I saved you, cried the woman, and you've bitten me, but why? You know your bite is poisonous, and now I'm going to die. Shut up, silly woman, said the reptile with a grin. You knew damn well I was a snake before you took me in. That's the end. That's the end. The snake. And that's what we're doing. We're taking in people that are very, very dangerous people. We're allowing them to come in, and they're being sent in here by the millions and millions and millions. 
Following the Eisenhower model, we will use all necessary state, local, federal, and military resources to carry out the largest domestic deportation operation in America. Chair, now recognize Mr. Sessions from Texas for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Gentlemen, welcome, and thank you very much for taking time. We've been sitting here listening and strongly identify that both of you have chosen to do this as strong uh, people who have an ethical and moral uh, idea about your service to this country. We want to thank you. Today we have examples of the Department of Justice and the IRS that have not just given special treatment to those who committed tax evasion and financial fraud with the President's family, but I think there's another point that we would want to make today. And that is that I believe that a taxpayer system where the agency is tasked with enforcing the laws fairly on regular citizens is also seeking the chance to shield those well connected to the President of the United States from consequences of illegal behavior in direct opposition to our nation's founding principles. We've established that. I think that's pretty clear what you've said today. But I have a question for both of you because I believe today's hearing goes beyond that, and that is that there are strong whistleblower protections under 5 C USC Section 2302, the Whistleblower Protection Act, that afford you and any other person who works in this government the protection from retaliation after making a legal, legally protected disclosure. In doing your job, you felt like there was something wrong, you said something about it, and you filed for whistleblower status because you believed that something was being held against you. In fact, both of you had made several legally protected disclosures during this time for the record. Is that correct? That's correct. That is correct. So after making this disclosure to the committee, did the IRS comply with the statutorily required whistleblower protections? How were you treated in this endeavor? So I'll start. So since I made these protected disclosures, they're legally protected. The IRS has chosen to retaliate uh, against me in multiple ways. Um, even now, there's uh, major case initiatives that actually uh, Special Agent Ziegler uh, started as well that are now being, you know, being put on the back burner and just being slow walked. Um, again, um, there's uh, the, the immediate super, my immediate supervisor and two levels above them haven't spoken to me since June 1st of 2023. Even though I'm sending them emails and trying to conduct my business on a daily basis, they literally have not spoken to me. Uh, you know, there's, there's Would that things, be normal? No, absolutely not. I mean, I'm, we're, we're running undercover operations. We're, we're doing interviews across the, wor uh, across the world. And, and, and it really becomes when, when senior leadership really cuts off communication like that, it in, you know, increases the chance of you know, some officer safety type issue when we can't communicate that, that, those type of issues with senior leadership and we have no support from them. Absolutely. Mr. Ziegler? To be completely honest with you, this is going to make me a little bit emotional. But like, and, I'm, and I'm sorry because I know this is personal. You spoke about that in your opening statement. Nev never have I thought that it, it's essentially like being left out on an island, and I don't know if that's done purposefully, but I, I essentially made disclosures up to the commissioner of the IRS. I, I said what happened, and the response I got a few days later was I, I, I may have broken the law, and don't ever do this again. Your, your emails need to go through your leadership. So to have that come to me was chilling. It was, I can't even put words to it. But what I can say is there are some people within my agency, some people in leadership that have been a person that I can go to for support, but the vast majority of it has just, it's the impact on the person, it's, it's, it's awful. Well, retaliation uh, is many times seen by people who know it when they see it. And that is why the law exists. And I want both of you to know as Chairman of Government Operations Subcommittee for this committee, Government Reform and Oversight, Government Accountability, I will be coming to the IRS and I will be going to other agencies 
specifically about their retaliation under the law within their agencies that we should take as a committee, a whole committee and a subcommittee,